at Clark Graduate University event. Um, we have an, in this meeting a number of English speakers and a number of Spanish speakers. And I'm going to ask David Hayes Bautista now to offer some instruction to the Spanish speakers so they will be able to listen to our presentation in Spanish. Para los hispanos parlantes, ahí abajo hay un botón titulado Interpretation, Interpretación. Hay que hacer clic y mudar el original, audio original y escoger español. Haz clic y ya sale en español. ¿Ok? Thank you, David. I will now introduce um, our two presenters for the evening. My name is Matthew Bowman. I'm the Howard W. Hunter Chair of Mormon Studies here at Claremont Graduate University, and this is part of our series on Mormon Studies. We are excited tonight to welcome Elisa Polito. Uh, she is actually an alum of our Mormon Studies um, program here at CGU, and she is the author of a new book, The Spiritual Evolution of Margarito Bautista, Mexican and Mormon Evangelizer, Polygamous Dissident, and Utopian Founder. Uh, this book was published with Oxford University Press recently, and at the end of our presentation tonight, I will give you uh, a code that will help you um, get a discount when you purchase it, as you will undoubtedly wish to do at the end of our time together this evening. We also have with us here uh, David Hayes Bautista. He is the Distinguished Professor of Medicine and Director of the Center for the Study of Latino Health and Culture at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. He's also the grandson of Margarito Bautista. We will tonight um, be hearing first from Elisa and then from David. Following their presentations, I will moderate a Q&A. You will find uh, that the chat function is muted. Um, you will not be able to use the chat. If you have a question, um, please put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, I will tell you this again when we're ready to do the Q&A. Our Spanish translation tonight is provided by Laura Reed, so we are grateful to her for being willing to share um, her skills with us. So I will first then turn the time over to Elisa Polito. Um, when she is done, we will hear from David. So Elisa, take it away. Alrighty, then. I'm going to screen share with um, you all. And so you'll have to let me know if you can see my slides. Can you? Okay, cool. So um, I'm very thankful to Matthew Bowman, Howard W. 100 Chair of Mormon Studies at Claremont Graduate University for setting up this event, and also to the Humanities Department at Claremont Graduate University. I'm very grateful for the support of the Tech Department and for the translator and for the opportunity to present with David Hayes Bautista this evening. Um, Bautista, uh, what I wrote for him was a spiritual biography and he's a very complex figure. Um, he is transnational. The study of him requires transdisciplinary research. And uh, what I like to say about T Baut Bautista is that he adds a Mormon chapter to the history of religious activism in the US-Mexico borderlands in the 20th century. And this was an era when converts, indigenous converts to many religions were, um, were requesting self-governance from the missionary movements that converted them. This evening, I thought it might be interesting to you if I were to talk about the writings of Margarito Bautista. You might ask me, why should we study about Bautista at all? And the reason is this. In most Euro-American missionary movements in the world, if you want to recover cover the voices of indigenous converts, you have to do it through the mission records made by Euro-American missionaries because there aren't records in the voices of indigenous converts. But Margarito left thousands of pages of writing behind. And I have on this slide um, some of his writings. He had a conversion narrative published in, in Utah in English. Then he wrote a tome of 564 pages called La Evolución de México, Sus Verdaderos Progenitores, Su Origen y El Destino de América y Europa, 
which was published in 1935. In English, that is the evolution of Mexico, its true progenitors, its origin, and the, dis the destiny of America and Europe. Um, another writing that's very important is his editing and partial authorship of the uh, La Informe General de la Tercera Convención, which is the general report of the Third Convention. In addition to all of this, he wrote scores of letters, poems, hymns, over 20 pamphlets, and he kept about 25 years, maybe 26, uh, of, di of diaries. So there are literally thousands of pages there. Of course, I won't be able to talk about all of them this evening, so I thought that I would focus on his 564-page tome, which I'm going to refer to hereafter as the, uh, La Evolución de México, The Evolution of Mexico, La Evolución de México. And then I will speak about his Informe General de la Tercera Convención, because both of these writings focus heavily on his um, championing of indigenous Mexicans through his um, Mormon hermeneutic, of his hermeneutic, his indigenous hermeneutic of Mormon scripture and doctrine, as well as through Mexican political policy at the time. So my argument this evening is going to be that Bautista's efforts to publish and distribute his thought through the U.S throughout the U.S.-Mexico borderlands was an authorial activism meant to offer a new spiritual identity to Mexicans and encourage them to prepare for a prophetic destiny of leadership on the world stage. So, um, oh, here we go. Um, before we get started with that, to contextualize Bautista and his life, um, I thought I would give you a little biography about him, a little timeline so that you can place him in time and space. In 1878, he was born in Atlautla, Mexico, uh, Mexico to Jose de la Luz Bautista and Petra Candelaria Valencia. And he, um, Atlautla is one of the communities on the slopes of Popocatépetl, the volcano. And he was converted to Mormonism in 1901 after he had briefly studied Methodism. He chose to convert to Mormonism. In 1903, he moved northward to the Mormon colonies um, in the state of Chihuahua. And then in 1910, he escaped the um, violence of the revolution because he immigrated two months before it broke out in northern Mexico to first Arizona, and then he traveled northward to Utah. In, in 1921, he helped establish the first Mormons, uh, Mexican Mormon Spanish-speaking con. Wi-Fi. Margarito. Everywhere he went, he, he proselytized and he set, up, um, he set up congregations. He was a regular congregation builder. And he began, um, though, when he, he went on a mission in 1922 to 1924. And when he came back, he found that they had replaced the Mexican leadership in the Spanish-speaking branch with European leadership and then Euro-American leadership. And he was quite upset about that there, um, along with other members of that congregation. And the disruption over that resulted in him not uh, or being, being um, removed from leadership in the Spanish speaking branch in Salt Lake City. And so he needed a platform from which to promote his, his uh, thinking about the salvation or the redemption of Mexico. And so he began writing. In 1935, he, he returned to Mexico to publish the 564 page tome he had written. While he was there in 1936, he helped organize the third convention, which we will get to. 
And uh, then in 1944, he founded Colonia Industrial Nueva Jerusalén, which we will also speak about later. And he died in Osumba in 1961. So let's talk about his magnum opus now, La Evolución de México. In La Evolución de México, uh, Margarito melded Aztec history with narratives of the Book of Mormon. So in this slide, I have some Aztec um, code codices on the bottom, or a codex, and above that is actually a drawing that he commissioned for his 564-page tome about the burying of weapons at one point um, in the Book of Mormon. So he re in this his book, he re-identified indigenous Mexicans as lost Israelites. They were a chosen people with a prophetic past. And this narrative, it comes directly from the Book of Mormon itself. That's one of the major reasons why he joined the Mormon church. Um, he also offered in this volume a prophetic plan from, for Mexicans, for the redemption of Mexico, which he also found in the pages of the Book of Mormon. And his plan for Mexico is this, obey God and prosper. So he, there were also these prophetic promises for Mexicans um, and all indigenous Americans that eventually sovereignty and land would be restored to indigenous Americans. He found this in the Book of Mormon as well. And he asserted that the destiny of Mexicans was to lead the world into the New Jerusalem as Mormon scripture also promises that um, they will be building the New, Jer New Jerusalem. Indigenous Mexicans will and Christ will live among them. So um, his methodology was this. He used classic secondary history texts familiar to many Mexicans. Any Mexican who had gone to secondary school would have been familiar with the works of Gregorio Torres Quintero, Guillermo Prieto, and Luis Perez Verdia. And um, he also uses over a thousand verses from the Book of Mormon, but he doesn't name them as such. He says he gets these from the ancient annals. And um, so I, he doesn't tell us exactly why he does this, but, but um, my thinking is that he wanted to introduce Mexicans to Mormon doctrine without, without um, incurring the prejudice that might have come back to him from that. Um, he also suggested a national convention be held in Mexico, wherein Mexican thinkers, religious thinkers would gather, they would examine the various forms of Christianity that had come down to them from uh, European colonizers and they would then decide which form of Christianity was the most pure and offer the results of their analysis as a gift to the world. Um, I'm fairly certain that he thought that Mormonism would certainly win out in this competition um, because he, the whole book is full of Mormon scripture from the Book of Mormon. And it is also uh, filled with with many prophecies on a common Mormon doctrine from the time. Um, he hoped, uh, I truly believe that in Margarito's mind, this book was a massive missionary tract um, because there were only about 2,500 Mormon converts in Mexico at the time, but he published 7,000 copies of his massive missionary tract and went to great lengths to market it. He did print and radio ads. He um, learned to dance before he um, attended the second National History Congress in Merida, which he participated in fully in terms of pre making a presentation, attending the social functions, and also introducing his ideas as much as possible to Mexican elites who were in attendance at this event. He also, Taught, uh, read from his book in sermons from the Mormon pulpit in Mexico. So what are the contributions then of La Evolución? Well, it's very important because Bautistas thought that the indigenous people 
were um, chosen people, that they were a prophetic people, Israelites, provides a point of comparison for other Mexican and Mexican American racial theorists. For example, Jose Vasconcelos, um, a Mexican philosopher who actually ran for president at one point of, Mex of Mexico, he, um, he published a book called La Raza Cosmica in 1924. And in his book, he states that the cosmic race will arise through miscegenation, or in other words, through um, interracial marriage. So he sees it as a combination of ethnicities, the ethnic, the cosmic race. Later, Reyes Lopez Tijerina says in um, his works that Hispanos or New Mexicans are Israelites through their Spanish heritage. This is in the 1960s. So Bautista prefigures him and he's a contemporary with Jose Vasconcelos. And as opposed to either of them, for him um, to be indigenous is to be chosen. So it also provides a Mormon chapter, his tome does, to spiritually based indigenous activism. And uh, we see another example of this in the life of Cesar Chavez in the 20th century, who invited priests out to the fields to have communion. And he also fasted and prayed extensively for vision, for direction on how to lead the um, farm workers toward um, empowerment. So this book highlights the importance also. We learn from this book how important it is to contextualize indigenous conversion experiences within historical, political, and cultural contexts. Because we can't always, um, we can't always anticipate the interpretation that an indigenous population will make of a missionary movement that comes from elsewhere in the world. Most people who convert to religions do so because they see in it a kind of cure. And for Bautista, what he saw in Mormon scripture, a Mormon doctrine, was a cure for the suffering, the centuries of suffering, four centuries of exclusion, marginalization, oppression, enslavement. He saw a cure for Mexicans and a new identity for them. Uh, we will talk a little bit more about that later. Now I'm going to switch over to his general report of the Third Convention. And the Third Convention was an indigenous movement among Mormon converts in Mexico in um, 19, that says 18, excuse my slide, it should say 1936, asking for indigenous Mexi uh, Mexican leadership within the Mexican mission. Um, this report that Bautista put together, um, the report that he put together says that, um, well, it, it puts together the It puts together the minutes as well as the reports and letters of several people. For example, there are letters from the convention that go to Salt Lake City, Utah. And all of this is put together, edited carefully, and then it's published as a pamphlet and sent not only to Salt Lake City, but um, also to Mexicans throughout Mexico, hoping to win them to the conventionist cause. Within the document, the grievances that Mexicans have are racial prejudice uh, within the mission, non-compliance of the church with Mexican law, such as anti-clerical measures, which said that foreign clerics could not be leading congregations within Mexico, and a lack of indigenous leadership opportunity. So, um, their document also reflects the influence of the Constitution of 1917 and the policies of Lázaro Cárdenas, who was the current president of Mexico from
from 19, he, his um, tenure was from 1934 to 1940. Um, specifically, they referred to articles three, articles 23, articles 130, um, and they were trying to um, use the, the articles of the Constitution to demonstrate that they had a right to petition, a right to assemble, to indigenous leadership in the mission that was guaranteed them by the Mexican government. These post-revolutionary measures that Cardenas was instituted revolutionary reforms, such as returning land to the indigenous uh, farmers in Mexico. And he also continued with policies of taking foreign of Mexican owners, ladies. And so at this time where Mexico empowered and particularly indigenous Mexicans, we see that, um, that they feel at odds with their church whose scripture told them but um, they, they, don't, they don't know, they don't see it being implemented. Um, so if we look at the country de la tercera convención, we see that it wards of the Mormon church. They thought deeply about um, not all Mexicans chose to be um, Mormons, right? So the one Mormons chose it at the time. And then it also demonstrates that Mormon response to post-revolutionary policies differed depending on your religious denomination. Catholics were opposed to um, this liberal government that was curtailing the wings of the Catholic church, or clipping the wings of the Catholic church. And so they instructed their members not to accept gifts of land and to oppose the liberal, liberal government's educational reforms. Um, Protestants, on the other hand, had been trained in mission seminaries to be educators. And so after the revolution, the Protestants joined forces with the liberal government to set up a public school system. This book also demonstrates the history of tension between Euro-American leaders and indigenous as converts to non-Catholic religions uh, is also reflected in the history of Mormon Mexico. And it provides a Mormon view of church-state relations and religious race relations in Mexico, the borderlands, and perhaps worldwide. Um, after his, his um, okay, in 1937, Margarito Bautista was excommunicated from the Latter-day Saint Church for his role in the Third Convention. And shortly thereafter, um, he was expelled from the Third Convention because um, they discovered that he was um, interested and in pursuing a, a polygamous practice for himself. That was not approved by the Third Convention. But he nevertheless continued to publish, continued to um, write throughout his life. This is just, these are just some of the many, uh, many publications, the little pamphlets that he put out and distributed. In fact, he had his own missionaries that distributed these pamphlets. Shortly after the, uh, there was extreme poverty in the colony when it first was established. And one of their first luxuries was hot showers. They, they were able to take showers, but after that, um, they, they splurged on a printing press. And about basically, and debate and the intended readership of Margarito's found themselves mainstream. Mormons, Euro-American mission leaders, 
Euro-American leaders of rival, rival fundamentalist movements and indigenous Mexicans everywhere. He continued to promote early Mormon practices such as um, polygamy and the communal ownership of property, but also Israelite identity and the need for Mexicans to prepare for their millennial roles. In fact, um, his writings anticipate the Chicano ethos in that it champions, it reclaims Mexican history, championing the achievements of ancient civilizations and also promoting a new identity for Mexicans. And the, the vision of um, the Plan Espiritual de Aslan is, is demonstrated through his idea about a millennial future and how life can be better for the Mexican population through obedience to God's laws, but also through communal living and uh, mutual respect. So these all make contributions to um, anyone studying religious entrepreneurial in the borderlands, Chicano studies and Mormon studies as well. I'd like to make a brief sub summary and conclusion here of why it's important to read Bautista and the contributions that his prolific authorship makes. Um, as I stated before, it was um, a meth it was authorial activism bent to bring a new indigenous voice and um, identity to Mexicans. We get to study this authentic indigenous voice of Margarito in his writings. We get to look at his unique hermeneutic of Mormon scripture, which promoted this um, Israelite identity, a reimagined Aztec history, a call for the future return of indigenous lands and sovereignty. And he promoted indigenous development, millennial future of indigenous peace and leadership. He contributes to, thusly, he contributes to Latin American religion, religion in Mexico, the history of religion in the US, the history of religion in the borderlands, ethnic studies, Mormon studies, and the history of indigenous activism in response to colonialism throughout the centuries. I'd like to thank you very, very much for coming to listen to me this evening. My work has been, um, um, a, a blessing to me. I have learned so much and I have had the excellent mentorship of, in, um, of Gaston Espinosa, Ignacio Garcia, and Fernando Gomez. I am very indebted to them. And also, I would just like to say that with 1.5 million members of the Church of Mexico and six million members of the church, maybe closer to seven million now, in Latin America, that there needs, there's a desperate need for more research and more study, and particularly for more indigenous scholars to become involved in this, in the study of Mormonism in Mexico. Thank you so much for coming this evening. I appreciate your attention, and I'm very excited for David Hayes's presentation which will follow mine. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think I speak for everybody when I say thank you to both of our presenters. Um, we've gotten here, I think, a, a fascinating network of genealogies for this man and uh, for the really important contributions that he made to religious history, to Mexican history, to American history, to Chicano history, to all sorts of histories. Right? And seeing all of this, I think, uh, laid out before us is good for all of us. Um, we now have some time for questions. So as I said at the top of the meeting, if you are interested in asking one of our presenters a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, I will then be receiving those and I will transmit them to our two presenters. And we already have, you will be happy to hear, I think, both of you, that we already have a few in here. Um, so the first for both of you, um, I will know it's directed to Elisa, asks particularly about Bautista's relationship with the LDS Church. 
if you could say a bit more about his excommunication, um, whether he was upset with his excommunication, how he viewed the LDS church after his departure from it. Okay, so his relationship with the LDS church evolved over time. And um, I think he reached a point where in his mind, well, he decided that the Mormon canon was more progressive than the church itself. And uh, it was at this point in time when he thought they weren't really um, championing the development of, you know, in the Book of Mormon, they call indigenous people Lamanites. They weren't championing the Lamanites like he thought that they should be. Um, and this began uh, around 1924. And that's when he wrote his tome and then went to Mexico to publish it and got involved in the Third Convention. Now, um, at the time of the Third Convention, he was not the only person excommunicated. There were seven leaders of the Third Convention who were excommunicated for insubordination, rebellion, and apostasy. That's what the mission minutes say. And it distressed him greatly. He wrote in his diary that his soul was drowned. He was so distressed that he, you know, uh, um, you can kind of see a personality develop. Well, I, I read through his diaries, there are certain things he wrote about every day. Um, he, was a, he was very clean, very, very hygienic. He would record when he had a shower, you know. <laughs> he was finding time to, you know, have a shower. And, um, and he was living with friends, you know, so... Um, this could be problematic on occasion, but he's a very fastidiously clean person. He um, loved to dance. He had this daily writing habit. I mean, I benefited from this daily writing habit, but also he went out to pray on like a hundred and over, every morning out, so out in nature. But I counted this one year, it was 1935. He walked and prayed over a hundred times in El Bosque de Chapultepec which is the seat of the Aztec kings. And um, the Castillo de Chapultepec at that time was like the American White House. It was where the Mexican presidents were living. So for him to pray every single day in this place of Aztec history um, goes to tell you how important it was to him. However, after his excommunication, he found it difficult to pray. And this was the first time or to receive kind of inspiration or know how to move forward. Um, he was, uh, and also, yeah, yes, he was, he was quite distressed by it. Yeah, you're muted, you're muted. Yes. <laughs> David, if you have anything to add, um, do feel free. Well, uh, I only met my grandfather once, and I don't remember, I was so young, my older sister told me about it. Uh, he was dead by the time I was starting to visit Tiacate every summer. So I heard everything secondhand. So it was always filtered uh, by who was telling me. And I linked up with my cousin, Christina, or exactly the same age, who happened to be uh, a card carrying member of the Communist Party of Mexico. So obviously I would get between Tiacate and her and you name every different versions filtered. Uh, and by the time I was hearing things, uh, he was pretty much over the Mormon church. Uh, now, again, I'm hearing the second hand. Uh, he would call it racist. He wanted nothing to do with it. That's why he wanted to set up his own church. Um, and he hated the Spanish with a passion. Again, I'm hearing this. Love indigenous, basically, the way it was explained to me. Anything good in Mexico? Oh, we indigenous did it. Anything bad? The Spanish brought that. And I have to say, it affected me until I was a, an undergraduate, uh, I thought I'd never go to Spain. I didn't want to shake a Spaniard's hand. Now I spend every summer in Spain. Uh, but, you know, even secondhand, he had an effect on me. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Matthew? Yeah, go ahead. Matthew? Um, I just want to add, you know, I stopped right at his excommunication, but um, David is correct there. Um, he, he finally totally distanced himself from the LDS church and was actually a, a competitor for converts with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints for his colony. Um, he associated with some um, Euro-American fundamentalists from the Mormon church in the United States. 
Um, but even eventually he kind of distanced them from them. Uh, one of the last things he wrote was a poem where he said, he asked God in this poem, uh, when will the white man cease? When will his arrogance and whatever cease? And God of Abraham cut him off. That was his, that was his poetic prayer. He wanted the white people cut off. So in the beginning, he was willing to collaborate, but, but um, he saw more and more, he, he felt they were hypocritical in their, um, their care and development for indigenous Americans. And to that term, we have a question about, um, from Jen Ramirez, a professor here at CGU on the use of the term indigenous. And he asks whether the two of you are making a distinction between indigenous via the Criollo and Mestizo identity versus indigenous via the United States and US-based institutions, which refer to the agency of nationals. Well, uh, there's a huge confusion there. Because remember, on October 11th, not one single Indian lived in the Western hemisphere. That didn't happen until the next day when Columbus was lost and thought he had found India. So, well, if I found India, you guys are Indians. And it's been confusing in colonial Mexico. It's confusing here. Uh, the U.S. actually, the government defines who is Indian by the individual treaties and the quantum, et cetera. And of course, because indigenous from Mexico are not part of that system, they're not considered indigenous. Uh, in, uh, the, back in Mexico, you do have the mestizaje. And by the way, Vasconcelos was anti-Indian. His idea of miscegenation, is that how, that's how you solve the Indian problem. You miscegenate them into criollos. Criollos, of course, were the uh, European descendants born in Mexico. And Alzate and Sor Juan were both criollos, but they absorbed, obviously, because they're born, that's very Indian country right there. Uh, in Mexico itself, there is now getting to be a distinction. There are two degrees of indigeneity because as uh, you're continuing to get population flows now from south to north, from Chiapas, Oaxaca, up into the Mexican Valley, then further up north. Uh, in towns around uh, Atlautla, and I haven't seen this yet in Atlautla, you will get, for example, Oaxacan indigenous doing the farm, they're basically like Mexicans here, okay? So the people in the town that have been there are no longer Indians. Indians are the ones who come from Oaxaca, Chiapas. We are el pueblo originario. That's the new term, pueblo originario. Mm -hmm. Then you have Indians on top of it. So it's been confusing all along. <laughs> and, um, and from what I had been told in the family stories, uh, Grandpa used to boast there was not one drop of Spanish blood in the family. And I used to think, you know, maybe there's not a lot, but not one drop. Now, that's not really too likely. So then two years ago, my wife and I did our DNA. And she's from northern Mexico. And it turned out, at least by the DNA, I don't have one drop of Spanish blood. So, Okay. You hear the family stories, you wonder how much of it is really true. And he was right, apparently. <laughs> On that, by the yeah. DNA, but you know, DNA has its issues too, its probability. <laughs> I can't imagine not one drop, but that's what it said. Mm -hmm. That was 23 and me. Yeah. Anything to add to that, uh, Elisa, or should I continue to the next question? Oh, no. Yeah, I, I wanted to make a comment, okay. but I, I would just like to say that I have a grandson who I know is an eighth Spanish. I know this. Um, however, his DNA says he has no Spanish blood. His DNA, like I say. It's yeah, like getting I medical mean, opinions. You go to three doctors, you get three different opinions. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, he has a, a grandfather who was a great grandfather, 100% uh, Spanish. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, when I use in indigenous in my book, um, I'd like to say that um, Margarito extended the promises in the Book of Mormon that he read to all Native peoples, North and South America, Central America. So I've used that, that term loosely to refer to all Native peoples um, because he saw these promises as extending to all of them. And also, you know, a lot of these 
borders that we impose in the United States. I mean, half the United States used to belong to Mexico, right? And so all of those native tribes um, in another world would have been called uh, Mexican um, ind indigenous peoples or Mexican natives. So, so I include all those and also I was really struck. I had already studied, when I started studying religion in Mexico, I had already studied Native Americans in the United States. I was very struck at the time by um, the rise of Native American prophets as you move from the East Coast to the West as they encounter um, Protestant missionaries. And um, these prophets prophesying of end times and the return of land and buffalo, etc. And, and then when I started studying religion in Mexico, I noticed that from the time of the conquest forward, there's also a rise of indigenous prophets or native prophets in Mexico, prophesying the same things a couple of hundred years before it ever happens in North America or the contemporary United States because the influence of the Spaniards um, and Christianity and missionaries uh, just arrives that much sooner. And Tupac Amaru also in Spain, or I'm sorry, in uh, Peru. That was actually during the Enlightenment. So it's been going on consistently. There's very long patterns. And I just saw that what you described Grandpa doing kind of fit this larger pattern. And by the way, we, we also need to be careful in the, when we use the term indigenous, like 100% Indian. As we look at the DNA, say the Thousand Genomes Project, where they've been doing sampling all over Latin America, the Caribbean, and Mexican Americans here in LA. Basically, by the one drop rule, about 90% of people that they've sampled are black, because they also had huge black populations, including not very far from Atlautla. You had a couple of black settlements. Uh, almost everybody has some indigenous, and almost everybody has some European, and in certain regions, almost everybody has some Asian. So to say indigenous, uh, there was a, uh, a singer from Oaxaca uh, who sang in Zapotec. He was kind of folklorist. And shortly before his death, he did his D DNA and it was discovered he's 30% African origin. At least his DNA came from West Africa. Uh, so even in theoretically unmixed indigenous, you can have a lot of mixture. So we need to be really careful about what we're trying to say by it. I like to look more at culture, civil society, rather than DNA and bloodline. That gets really gets really complex very quickly. We're and doing it's it. It was interesting to me that um, Margarito never uses the word mestijo, mestizo, or mestizaje, mm -hmm. because for him, it didn't matter. If you were any part native, you were chosen. You were Israelite. You were, uh, and so, yeah, I'll just, I'll just throw that out there. Mm -hmm. That's true. I, I've never seen it in any of his writings. And I think I have most of his pamphlets as well, his boxes of yeah. them. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting because uh, now you have a lot of uh, Latter-day Saints who um, are concerned about DNA studies, right? Um, saying that there is no Israelite blood in the American Native peoples. Um, I don't think... From what I see of Native peoples, well, especially Bautista, when, when they join a church, they join a narrative, they join a spirituality. They're not looking for science, right? And so, um, yeah, I, I keep that in mind that um, I'm, I don't know what Margarita would say about DNA today. I don't, I only know what his take was um, about, about chosenness when he wrote. We have another um, interesting question um, about Bautista's community. Um, how many followers did he attract to this community? Um, what happened to them as Bautista began to introduce polygamy to this community? And what happened to that community? Is it still there? You want to take it, Elisa, or I can Okay, jump sure, and then I'll pass it on to you. Um, Okay, so he started out with a few dozen followers in his colony. Um, but by that time, he had already separated from the Third Convention. So when he's proselytizing, he's talking about polygamy. And they already know when they come to, the, to his colony that that's what it's about. 
communalism and, and many of them were desperately poor and were excited to practice communalism. And, you know, communal farmland lands are traditional and sort of, you know, normal in Mexico. And so this was an attraction to some people who needed some land to farm and, and wanted to join um, with, other, with other people. It's interesting because communalism didn't last very long in, in, well, in the Mormon church. They kept going through different iterations of how to practice it. But, um, but it, it survived quite a while. This colony is still around. I don't know that they practice the same kind of communalism that they had, but the last I heard, there's over a thousand members I heard they had one resident who went to Oxford to study mathematics. Um, it's a beautiful little community with lovely gardens and roses. But I have to say that the founding of it was, was terribly difficult work. Just, I mean, at first they were living in holes, but they covered with tree branches because they didn't have homes built. They had to get plumbing installed and, um, yeah, and there was some discussion of what they were going to do for a living, but they, they ended up um, growing flowers, which they sold, carnations and daisies and things. But they also grew vegetables and foodstuffs to feed themselves. Um, now, I believe there are people of various um, occupations within the colony. And also, um, some are polygamous and some are not polygamous. But the colony survives. And in the United States, the lifespan of most intentional communities is about 18 months. So this one founded around 1945, surviving um, to 2020, it, it's extraordinary. Very much so. But remember, they've had now this history because the Altepe, it was common lands. That, and that's what they tried to get rid of with the Constitution of Reforma in 1857, no more communal lands. But in that zone, I mean, you get the old stories, uh, so I don't know if that would have helped this survive longer than the hippie communes up in Northern California, which if they lasted 18 months, wow, that's pretty good. Most ones I do busted not too long afterwards. Uh, I just want to add to that, that uh, he went, um, he had meetings with various people in the government trying to get land for his colony and he just couldn't get any. And he actually had a falling out with his father, Jose La Luz de Bautista over his, ex, his expulsion from the Third Convention. Um, Jose de la Luz actually disowned him. And when he was lay dying, um, and um, this is uh, from the oral history of Anis and Bautistas, his father wouldn't even let him feed him with a spoon. And he would say, you know, he was so disappointed in him because he felt that the Third Convention actually had a chance of succeeding. But by Bautista, uh, Margarito pursuing polygamy and being thrust out that it kind of split the convention apart. So he wasn't thrilled with him. However, and so he wouldn't give him any of his land, but his father got a, a pretty good sizable chunk of land for his service in the Zapatistan army. Um, Jose, uh, no, uh, Mar Maroni Spencer de Olarte has written about this. And, um, he got this land grant for his services. So he willed all of that land to his tia Cata. Cata had all the land and uh, eventually he had pity on Margarito and gave him the land at a very cheap price in exchange for helping her with repairs on her home. She was a single woman at that point. And so there was a kind of an exchange of help there. She was always a single woman. And that's, by the way, it's the same story as she told. So it's nice to hear a couple of different sources uh, uh, doing that. And what Tia Cata did, by the way, is she kind of took in the orphaned kids of the family, the larger extended Bautista family, uh, and kind of raised them. She never got married. She never got married, but she always had oodles of children that were related. She just took them in and raised them. She had a big house. Half of it got torn down when they widened the street. But, you know, that happens. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of questions that ask some more questions about this community, um, and I'll, so I'll meld a couple of those together. Could you speak a bit about the progress of this community in Bautista's lifetime, particularly with reference to his relationships with the other Mormon groups in Mexico, the LDS Church, which had some Anglo colonies in Chihuahua, 
um, but also the fundamentalist Mormon groups, which also had some problems north there. Did Bautista and his group have interactions with these other groups? Um, was there interchange of followers among these different groups? Um, and how um, does that relationship persist today? Um, yes, he, um, he knew Dare LeBaron from his days in Mesa. They painted alongside each other as, um, you know, working to earn money. And uh, the LeBaron colony is started, the, the father of it is like Dare LeBaron. And he knew his two sons. In fact, his two sons, two of Dare LeBaron's sons came down and were missionaries helping Margarito in his colony. And then he went up to help the LeBarons with their colony in Las Parcelas. But um, I've mentioned this before, I'll mention it again. Um, also, Joseph Musser and Rulin C. Allred came down and had dealings with him. The um, Joseph Musser ordained Margarito Bautista to be like the patriarch to Latin America. And he was, he was ordained a prophet, seer, and revelator. And he was made one of the Council of Twelve, or the Council of Friends, which caused the problem for Joseph Musser because his followers didn't want a Mexican on the Council of Twelve. Um, Joseph Musser didn't listen to that. He, he was very um, interested in, in Margarito and visited his colony many times. In fact, um, Margarito went out and tried to find a colony for Joseph Musser in Mexico, um, somewhere near him, but that never did pan out. They exchanged literature back and forth. They would produce booklets and pamphlets, you know, like, like manuals and reports and little newspapers that they would exchange between each other. He grew apart from the LeBarons partially because one of them claimed to have a revelation that made him God's foremost authority on church and he envisioned um, Margarito underneath his, his authority, which didn't sit well with Margarito. I can imagine. <laughs> and also they tried, to, they tried to lure his colonists away from him with gifts of money and land. And um, so that didn't sit well with him either. Um, so he kind of had a falling out with the LeBarons. Now, um, I mentioned before that many of these fundamentalist groups held very tightly to the early revelations of Joseph Smith and to the Book of Mormon. They were kind of Book of Mormon literalists. So when it says that people will become white again, they took that literally and thought that if they could develop Mexicans enough, they would become white. So um, there, this I think Margarito put up with that at first because they were actually providing opportunities for him. But I, I just uh, read something, and if I do a second edition, this will be in my second edition. It's not in there yet, um, but um, there's a report that Joseph Musser came down to Mexico because he had heard of a rumor of a white Lamanite in Guatemala. And he was going to go find him and turn the keys of the priesthood over to this highly righteous white Lamanite. He stops by Margarito's colony on the way down there. And Margarito is reportedly quite furious. I'm going to research this all and, and, and um, fill out all the gaps. But of course he was furious. <laughs> he tried to be, um, he stuck very closely to the early doctrines of the church. And he was a perfectionist. I mean, he really, really believed that if he could keep all these early commandments perfectly, Mexicans would, it would help them. It would, they would be redeemed. God would intervene on their behalf. So, so when he hears that, I guess because he hasn't turned white yet, <laughs> that now the keys of the priesthood were going to go to this um, white Lamanite that is rumored in Guatemala, that, then of course, that, that's, so it was always about white. You know, and, uh, and that's one reason I think that he continues to get increasingly distanced from anybody. His last, one of his most brilliant, or I, I would say in creative theological terms is when he decides that because they've been ordained now by Euro-Americans, 
Mexicans will be like the biblical patriarchs and pass the priesthood on from father to son, and they no longer need the oversight of any Euro-American ecclesiastical leaders of any level. He, he became that, that distance from them. But um, of course, they went down looking for the white Lamanite and never found him. So, there you have it. Um, we have time for one more question. And, and David, I believe we've found a relative. Um, we have uh, Susanna Bautista. Oh, yes. I'm going to read her question. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was Margarito's brother, is it Isidro? And my mother was born in the colonies in Chihuahua. What happened between Atlauta and Chihuahua? How many Mormons went north, and why didn't others go north? Now, that's a good question. Um, it, it's, it's not, wasn't at that point the typical migration route yet. It was mainly, at that point, migration was mainly from northern Mexico going up. I think it was just kind of the wild hair thing, and maybe you have anything on this, Elisa. Uh, there weren't a lot of Protestants even in that region in the late 19th century. So it would have taken, a, I guess you could say a real wild hair, and he was definitely a wild hair, no question about it, uh, to have done all of that. Uh, so that he took his brother uh, and they went together and then up to the US, but I don't think there would have been a whole lot more from at least that region from the Valley of Mexico at that point. I just can't, can't see that really. Um, yes, there was uh, a point hi, in Susie. time. Hi, <laughs> Susie. It's sad to say hi. Yeah. Welcome to all about you, family. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, I, I really, um, the, the, the Bautistas married in with the Sunigas, right? So oh, the there Pisces was a point. And... Pardon? Oh. Piuses. Yeah. Piuses. So, uh, Mendeses. <laughs> Uh, when they first started the Mormon colonies, they needed indigenous, uh, well, okay, Mexican native residents in order to have land and water rights. Mm -hmm. So they sent down, and this is around, eight, you know, it's around 18, it's shortly before the manifesto, right? So it was like 1888. And they sent down and brought a whole bunch of converts because that's where most of their converts were in central Mexico up to the colonies. And it didn't work out very well between the two groups because the colonists felt that the Mexicans uh, were lazy and the Mexicans are thinking, why are these people living in holes and rocks? If God had wanted people to live here, you wouldn't have to build a three mile canal to water your crops. What in the heck are you doing? And they were confused because um, they'd never seen the practice of polygamy up close. And these people are practicing it got to the point where they said, heck with it. And they went back down. And one of those families was Jose Suñiguez, a family, right? Um, that went back down. They walked a thousand miles all the way back down to Mexico. So you don't get too many people from the central converts moving back up there until Mar Margarita goes in 1903. By that time, they've got orchards and schools and tree-lined boulevards, but all the land has already been parceled out. And so any Mexicans that come up there after that can't get, uh, they, they can't get a decent parcel of land. The best ones are gone. That actually is perfect timing. Um, we were promised we'd wrap this up after 90 minutes and it is at 90 minutes. So my apologies to those of you whose questions we did not get to. Um, we are grateful to you for coming. I am right now putting in the chat a offer code. Um, you can go to the Oxford University Press's website, enter the promo code AAFYLG6 and get a discount on Elisa's book. Um, I hope you all order it. I think we've all learned a lot about Margarita Bautista. Um, you can tell us about many, many things. So I will let either of you, David or Elisa, if you want to say a closing word or two, and then we will wrap up. Take it away. Um, uh, I was just going to say that if you want to copy questions on the Q&A um, and send them to me, as I, it may take me a little while, but I, I'll answer them as I get to them. I'm, I'm happy to answer people's questions. But I, I really want to thank David for coming. He added so much to this evening's presentation. I 
I learned a lot from it. And um, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you to all the attendees who came as well. Alisa, is it all right with you if I put your email address in the chat? Uh, yes. So the panelists can see it? Great. All right, everyone. I am putting Elisa's email address in the chat. Um, so she generously has offered um, for you to reach out to her. So you can reach out to her if you have any further questions. And again, um, do use this offer code, purchase her book. Um, thank you again, everyone. It's been a wonderful evening, and we are thank grateful you. to our panelists. Thank you very much. Good night. Thanks for being together. Thank you, David. Thanks, Matthew. Okay. Of course.